Justicia region, Astrea. Have you guys ever ridden one of these cable cars? It's legit horrifying. Once I did this crazy hike in China where I was walking on a like a plank of six inches of wood above a sheer cliff drop. By far the most terrifying part of it was just the, the cable car ride on the way up. <laughs> is that what this is about? Of course, I should have known sooner. It's about women. That's the hustle? I mean, it makes so much sense. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about letter writing? That's weird. That opens up some weird doors. Is that just his cynical take on it? Or is there something actually to this? That's a weird can of worms. I'm not sure I want opened. I mean, especially considering how grim all those women's faces were as they ascended that, that mountain. It would be sort of hilarious though, like in all this letter writing and character exploration and, you know, uncovering your deep, dark personal secrets. There's just one person in the mix who's like, yeah, I just want to meet a, meet a rich guy. I want to marry a rich guy. I mean, I actually don't even have a problem with that. If that's just something someone wants and doesn't have unrealistic expectations of that solving all their problems or dealing with other issues to each their own. Is it that she looks more mature? Or is it that my image of her has matured based on what I've seen? She's done so much. Exactly, I also admire your work with the Princess of Drossel. She's a legend. How far we've come. Like, what's eating them? It's weird. This, this bizarre display once again. What's eating Violet? <laughs> the guys are so starstruck that it's affecting their posture. Finally, the book episode. We've all been waiting. Yes, book maintenance. <laughs> That's what I'm about. <laughs> Library episodes are always great. Maybe we'll meet a surly owl along the way. It's their job to transcribe them and save the manuscripts once and for all. But where is the emotional heart going to come from this episode then? Given the... Oh, it's from it's from him. He's the one. There's something about auto doll work that kind of triggers his his memories or trauma or whatever. This is all just this is all the pretense. Like so many things are, you know, you put a task in front of something, you put a your face on an activity. It's just speed dating. <laughs> I don't need to work with a girl. Lending herself out here and there to write letters. That's exactly the thing he hates. Or he mentioned that as a, a bad trait. Because it doesn't hurt that she's easy on the eyes. Everyone's a gangster until you meet Violet Evergarden. <laughs> or, you know, by extension. Someone you're attracted to. There's a lot we gotta unravel here. This is a lot it has to come out. We're not writing a letter for him though, so what's the vehicle? This is light work. We have once written a musical to entertain an entire nation. That sounds like something that would make for a great ending sequence. <laughs> Once in 400 years comet. Oh. That's gonna go one of two ways. He's either gonna like her more, or he's gonna be deeply offended because of how much he covets his own skill. And that'll say a lot about him. Is he, like, translating while reading? That also is an impressive skill. That's tough. Getting a little competitive. That's in the eternity of the land of fairies, they are blessed with a new and its soul would be protected forevermore. I wanna, I'm gonna go back and listen to this myth again because it's interesting. I'm so focused on their little character drama. What is the significance of the story of the Arrow of Light? 
So that's a really bizarre story with the light, like inflicting plagues upon the earth and killing nobility and, and making women mistresses. But that being a good thing, because there's a sort of afterlife type thing that's promised. I have some ideas, but I kind of want to see where this episode goes. I think it's going to end with a comet and a light. I really hope this all ties together because that would be awesome. It's super intriguing as a setup. It also seemed to affect Leon on an emotional level to read that story for some reason. I wonder what his backstory is. <laughs> They're a good pair. It's been a great day of speed dating. <laughs> yeah, I'll say it was favorable for everyone, probably. Except for the couples that just really hated each other. It was no fun for them. This ray of light that comes in and brings devastation and salvation. Could it be like truth? So you gotta learn to love it. Traveling can be great. Indeed! Tell me about it. I want to find the meaning. That's not the truth. She chose this. That's a really big-minded way to look at it. Wow. She's lucky. I feel like that's actually pretty rare. I also think that kind of thinking is somewhat essential. To always be there in some form. It just kind of keeps you grounded and humble. It's good to have a little bit of doubt, as long as it's not like eating you up and you know, you're not hating yourself or whatever. Who's talking trash about my my boy Leon? Whoa there. This is just a shady flirting technique. You don't want to be putting other people down, talking crap, in order to score a date. That's just, you're setting yourself up for failure. Because one of two things is just going to happen. You're going to end up being successful, but the person for whom that strategy is going to work, probably not someone you want or around. Is that too harsh? Is that too crazy to say? Uh, what kind of beautiful woman is swayed by someone trash-talking another guy? I don't know, that's sort of where it ends for me. That's really what, what will probably happen most of the time, is just people will be creeped out by that. <laughs> if dating is showing off your good qualities, your best quality is talking about someone else's worst quality? Way to go. Yes, I love Violet setting them straight. Don't judge a book by its cover, jerks. Oh, that backfired. Yeah, of course, it's never not really about that. Suddenly, you know, we think it's all fine, it's all great. Also, I lived in a box for a while. At least they're committed to their vision of <laughs> terribleness. <laughs> At least they're consistent in their just hateful, hatefulness. Points for that, I guess. I found a lot more, too. I found a connection. This is just my face. I used to get that, so people used to always tell me I looked angry, like in high school. People always thought I was angry. I wasn't angry all the time. Sometimes angry. <laughs> it's all just a date. Life is just one long round of speed dating. <laughs> That's all it is. That's the meaning of life. They knew what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. Coupling everyone up. I also just don't eat. So you have to specially request me to eat. Uh-huh. There's a reason for it. I wasn't just military, I was like the killing machine. So much so that people thought I was a Terminator. Oh, I forgot about the cliffhanger last episode. We still have to account for this burning. Is that why she's looking sad? That didn't really get addressed that I saw. We're gonna see this comet and something's gonna happen. Royalty will die and mistresses will be made and a plague will happen, but it's alright. Because... Heaven? It's a date! That bread really suffered the brunt of his anxiety. <laughs> still good though, I still eat it. Alright, well I mean, they, he's doing better than they did in like two and a half seasons of Kaguya-sama Love is War, so even though it wasn't perfect, it was something. And I feel like I know this dynamic, this like bro dynamic. They're talking about girls the whole four days that they're sharing accommodations. The whole four days is all they're talking about is their respective girls. Why is it not a bigger deal? Uh, which is them too? Watch out for the light, the tail of the light. It's gonna unreal, unveil some stuff that is dangerous at first. This is actually a great date. It's like irreplaceable. No one will have this date, this exact date, for another 200 years. At least you're honest. 
and vulnerable. It's so, I, I don't know, like, it's always so clear in shows. I, I wonder why it's harder to do. But like, in certain contexts, when it's called for, when there's like a certain level of familiarity that's reached, the right amount of vulnerability at the right moment, if it's honest vulnerability and not sort of exploitative vulnerability, like purposely trying to hit at something that causes a reaction that you want, and is instead really just like putting down defenses and, and having a moment of reflection, and honesty of like a fear, let's say, that's endearing to me, at least watching. And I think it doesn't always go well, but I think it not going well is, you know, maybe not an indicator of you, but the other person and where, where they are. Assuming that what I said before is true, that it really is sort of a pure expression. That can be a little bit difficult. It can be a little hard to know what's what. I think it takes practice to like kind of watch yourself and listen to what you're saying. I mean, the last episode contained some great examples in their letter writing. To me, part of what made the relationship dynamic special between the princess and that guy was that they were both sort of just letting all their defenses down and they were clearly articulating what they were afraid of. And it allowed the other person to see who they really were and make their own choices respecting, you know, each other's agency and not trying to, you know, gameplay, but also giving each other a chance to pick up the slack, you know, giving other people a chance to be there for them in a, in a way that is meaningful, which is probably what they wanted. So it's sort of like, you can't really go wrong. You know, if it's, if it's the right person, then the vulnerability and honesty is right. And if it's the wrong person, then the vulnerability and honesty is right. Because if you're paying attention, maybe you can sniff that out. <laughs> Yeah. What Violet said was also true, and more, because she doesn't care. She doesn't care about that. It's not like she's super lofty and, you know, high position, has pretenses about what people do. She's she's like a killing machine, or was. Following in the footsteps of his father a little bit. She, he lost both of them to the same thing. It's really tough. It's really tough because I get it. You gotta have compassion for the mom a little bit, and that she was hurting greatly. Probably to guess though, I would say that she does. That's more like the truth, yeah. It's kind of obscured from her. Absolutely. Right. Or it's just missing him. But either way. I'm wondering if this loneliness thing isn't a translation thing. And maybe there just isn't that concept of like, I miss you in Japanese. Because in Korean, while there is uh, a way to say you miss certain things, as far as I know, people don't really say like, I miss you. I've never come across I miss you as a concept in Korean. It's more like, I want to see you. This is him testing out sort of his questions about his mother's behavior. I mean, I think she would go. And very weirdly, very directly, giving him the insight he was looking for about his mother. Yeah, and I probably would do the same. Don't judge a book by its cover, you should know that by now. I, we're not quite ready for that. <laughs> Speaking of devastating devastation incoming. Beware of the light, though. Violet. Oh, okay, other people are doing the same date. That makes sense. Yeah, that's true. Well, I still don't know what to make of this comment, but I, I really like their conversation. He's he's definitely left as sort of a new new being in light of this new information. Like, yeah, his mom was just in love with the father and she was devastated and was just following her heart. And I think that it would be natural for a kid to internalize that as her choosing one over the other, meaning that there was love for only one and not love for the other, that she didn't love him and was able to abandon him. But that's not how she, the mother was framing it at all, of course. You know, love is not a binary thing like that. And it's not something that's really divided by its sharing. It's just that was the most pressing thing. You know, she was worried about the father's death. The son is sort of there. She can trust that he'll be okay in her absence, which maybe is not correct. There's definitely 
ways that she could have been a better mother, but it's not the same thing as what he's internalizing it as, as that he's just unworthy and that his mother didn't love him, etc. That he's abandonable, that people will fail you. You know, there's an element of truth to all your fears. Generally speaking, you know, every fear is not something that's formed out of a vacuum. It's because there's a reason to fear it. it. It's like a thing that could happen and probably is happening to some small degree. The problems occur when they're blown up to, you know, the umpteenth degree and they become these binary things of great or terrible. People are always kind of suffering with things. People are always sort of having mixed feelings and wayward thoughts. But what's more important is what they choose on the aggregate. People can have all sorts of channels flowing at once but I think the only thing that really matters is what their predominant ones are. And I think the more that stance kind of gets softened and you can see people as human being complex and you forgive other people for their inner turmoil the way you, you know, hopefully forgive yourself for your, your inner turmoil, it becomes a lot more manageable. It's a lot to ask of someone that young. What we're seeing now is an adult version that hasn't really moved much since that kid version when he was abandoned. But that's just the work he has to do. And I think that's that's a common path. It's kind of easy to identify with that for me. You know, the, the growing up realizing that your parental figures, just authority in general, is not something you can place your full being in. It's not something you can have full deference to and still be healthy and expect it to always take care of you and give you what you need. And be fully emotionally healthy. You know, there's a point at which you have to separate from that a little bit and realize that while you hope that there is support for you in key ways, fundamentally in some ways, it's going to be a task on you to like understand that there is no absolute authority, that it's all just human human beings. And the answer to having what you wanted in the first place is to becoming that yourself. And then of course, if you're able to do that, then you ironically end up being or being able to be that kind of reliable authority for someone else, say your kids or whatever. <laughs> Crushed it. Crushed this transcribing and speed dating event. What? That's it? I was sure there was going to be marriages at the end of this. As surely as I, as that comment would come. This is an interesting relationship though. It ended up being not romantic at all. It ended up being very sort of spiritual. He's been carrying a lot of this for a long time. That's why he's hating on it. He secretly wanted it, but felt like he couldn't do it. I guess that's the destruction. It does seem like the light of truth in a way. You know, something comes along and wrecks your world, but there's no reason to dis need to despair. Because what you're left with is the raw, sometimes br brutal, but beautiful truth. Something very melancholy about this. Will he make it? Will he not make it? <laughs> Oh my god, oh my holy crap. <laughs> that scared the hell out of me. Alright, I don't think, I don't know if this is intentional, but there was something that came across to me in that scene that felt unhinged. <laughs> it's gonna take a while. It's just a devastating power of like an illuminating light. She's going through stuff. It's like a lot of stuff happening for Violet right now. A lot of good with her emotional development, but of course, that's not all going to be pleasant. Sunshine and rainbows. Man, this, this episode gave me feelings, as this show does. It's really hard. Like, you got all these fears about what things mean and what the world is. And there's a lot of layers that that's represented at, I think, in this episode, although I could be overreading it. There's there's his journey, there's Leon's journey, and worrying about you know who he is and what his mother's disappearance meant. Also, I think it's a bold choice, by the way, that as far as I know, we didn't get an answer about where, where his father went. It's just sort of a mystery, which is cool. Because it doesn't matter, it's about him. And then there's also the weird, like, the weirdness about the whole doll thing. There's a lot of darkness in this world as well. Definitely just by, you know, nature of it being a world, and worlds just typically having a lot of da the darkness that is there, whether or not we want to look at it. And there's all these pain things sort of lurking there and it's so much easier and nicer to kind of try to disprove it you know say that the darkness isn't there but then you, you kind of know you know you know deep down that the things you're afraid of the things that are bothering you there is reality to them like I said and they do represent potential dangers and in many cases it's probably worse than you think like for every dark corner that's been revealed for you to see what was lurking there are who knows how many other dark corners that just are completely unknown to you because they're dark. If we were to get the full weight of that, what would that feel like? But then I think, I mean, actually, it's gonna be worse than you think, but also it's gonna be way better than you think. You know, it's not its not gonna matter. It feels almost like the thing that hurts the most is the, the battle, you know, the fight to not see it. Could knowing the full truth be bad? Like, if we really were able to just suddenly cast flashlights on all the shadows and for a moment see the entire world for what it was, would it not be illuminating of the fact that there is bad 
but on the aggregate, it forms a picture that is beautiful, that the danger of those things is kind of exacerbated not by the fundamental nature of those things themselves, but of the fact that they are hidden. You know, it's the hidden things that are the most terrifying. To bring everything into the light and just see it for what it was, wouldn't that just then be truth? And wouldn't the truth just be a good thing to know? Going back to Masaroshi for the umpteenth time, the truth is only painful if you are living a life of lies. That quote has sort of haunted me to no end. You know, like what are the truths that I'm hiding from in any underlying moment of pain? And I don't know if this is the, the intended reading of it, but that's sort of what the comment feels like to me. It comes along and the result is devastating. It's a plague and death and also mistresses for some unknown reason. But there's no need to fear because what's left is something of great strength and maybe divinity even. If it's actual truth, then it's going to be of the universe and the universe seems to me to be a force of divinity just by definition. So this episode is not the, the most relevant in terms of um, like individual characters or like specific events, but there's something about it that captures a, a, an important element of this whole struggle, this whole struggle for truth and self-revelation. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this is the episode where we see Violet start to sort of come undone in a new way. She doesn't seem the same, like the same person. She seems more human but way, way more troubled.